No sign of slowing down. North Korea firing off another ballistic missile. Terror network roundup. Police in Manchester make more arrests in the concert attack investigation. And Angela Merkel's warning. The German Chancellor says Europe cannot completely rely on its allies. Thanks for your company, everyone. I'm Michael Holmes. Amber is off today. Welcome to CNN. And we begin with the breaking news from the Korean Peninsula. The U.S. military confirming the North Koreans have fired a short-range ballistic missile. According to South Korean defense officials, the launch happened near Wonsan. The U.S. Pacific Command says the missile flew for six minutes before landing in the waters off mainland Japan in that country's exclusive economic zone. That is clearly not sitting well with Tokyo. This is North Korea's third ballistic missile launch in as many weeks. Our David McKenzie tracking this live from CNN Beijing. Uh, you know, dare we say, here we go again. This is, this is becoming almost a routine event if it wasn't uh, so serious. And where it landed, causing a lot of concern. Fill us in on what you know. Well, what we know is that this was a Scud-type missile, according to the South Korean uh, military. They believe, at least at this stage, it's early days yet. As you say, it flew from the eastern uh, side of the Korean peninsula in an easterly direction. Japanese uh, m officials saying that it went into its economic zone, uh, saying that that could have been a, a dangerous issue uh, for ships and obviously airplanes in the region, though no sign that there was any uh, kind kind of uh, accidental issue with this missile. Uh, the U.S. Pacific Command, as you say, uh, tracked it for six minutes. It appears it flew around uh, 450 kilometers or 280 miles, uh, uh, certainly, as you say, uh, yet another provocation from North Korea after a series of tests in recent weeks. Uh, Prime Minister Abe in Japan just moments ago speaking to reporters saying uh, we can never tolerate that North Korea has this continued provocation, ignoring the repeated warning uh, by the international community. And I'm paraphrasing there. So certainly anger from Japan uh, and uh, South Korea uh, and a continued uh, tests despite the calls uh, of uh, concern uh, from the international community. Michael? Yeah, and, and David, you mentioned uh, Mr. Abe's statement and uh, one other line from that, in order to deter North Korea, we will take concrete action together uh, with the United States, which sounds all rather ominous. And, th and this, this is really the point, isn't it, David? And you've, you've covered this so many times now. Um, uh, uh, sanctions, warnings, uh, uh, you know, uh, submarines in the region, U.S. submarines, aircraft carriers, none of it seems to stop the missiles. No, no, none of it seems to stop the, the kind of progressive uh, moves by Kim Jong-un to develop their nuclear program. And the eventual aim, uh, say experts, of course, is to place some kind of warhead uh, successfully on an intercontinental ballistic missile. Now, the uh, SCUD missile is a, a type of missile, should it be uh, that short-range missile, that has been around in North Korea for some time. It isn't necessarily one of these newly developed missiles, but we'll have to wait and see. Experts say that every test is a step closer to that moment uh, where they can, uh, and in Pyongyang, can be able to have the technology uh, on the right sort of weapon from their perspective. Now, the Pacific Command saying that this missile didn't threaten the continental or U.S. airspace at all uh, at this stage. And, um, you know, another thing from the Japanese Prime Minister, as you suggest, uh, what next? Well, the assumption is at some point the UN Security Council will have to uh, decide that the level of provocation from North Korea is substantial enough to actually bring in new sanctions and a key to that of course would be here in China they have not commented yet on this missile test uh, and they have been less willing to push the boundaries of sanctions in the past Michael yeah and we'll see what this latest uh, missile test brings David McKenzie in Beijing thanks so much well, raids are ongoing in England to try to find more people connected to the man who killed 22 people last week at a concert site in Manchester. Officers raiding several homes in the city on Sunday, arresting two more men 
They now have 13 people in custody for questioning. The Home Secretary says some of the people connected to the bomber, Salman Abedi, could still be at large. Senior International Correspondent Atika Schubert joins us now live from Manchester late in the evening there. Uh, Atika, a lot happening, it seems, every day. More arrests and, uh, and uh, going on and the investigation continues. There could be more people out there. Fill us in. I think the investigation will still go on for several weeks, but overall, the terror threat level has been uh, reduced, actually, and the Home Secretary has said that m the police are fairly confident that they've rounded up most of Salman Abedi's network. However, there is still the potential uh, that some of the network are still at large. Uh, and that's why we continue to see these arrests and these searches. I mean, every day here in Manchester, we've seen uh, locations being searched in the last few hours, another two arrests. Um, and so they're really trying to uh, make sure they get every member of this network. Uh, one of, that's one of the reasons they actually released those photos from CCTV from just before the attack in order to release them to the public and say, listen, can you help us retrace his steps? And Let's find out who exactly he was talking to and where he was. And, and Atika, uh, another development, they, they think they have found where this bomb was built, is that right? Yeah, this is actually a property that they searched a few days ago. Uh, it's a city center uh, short-term apartment uh, rental. Uh, and it appears that uh, Abedi was there just before the attack. And police now believe that he used this as sort of a staging ground, assembling the bomb there. Um, but they're also looking at a number of other locations, kind of following the chemical clues. Uh, one At one uh, high-rise apartment block in North uh, Manchester, for example, there are forensics teams still searching the apartment at another property in South Manchester we saw a police take out copper piping so they're really trying to piece this together to figure out how did he assemble this bomb and if he had help Atika Schubert in Manchester our thanks well Manchester meanwhile showing its resilience on Sunday by going on with one of its biggest events playing the Oasis anthem, Don't Look Back in Anger, and runners singing along before taking off in the Great Manchester Run. People sang that song a few days ago as well, you may remember, after a moment of silence for the victims. More than 35,000 people raced on Sunday, many of them wearing yellow and, support, and sporting bees in a show of solidarity. Bees, an important symbol for Manchester. And now to a sobering message from the German Chancellor Angela Merkel who says Europe can no longer completely rely on its long-standing allies. Those comments coming just days after the meetings of course of NATO and G7 nations which were attended by the US President Donald Trump. European leaders and Mr Trump failed to agree on many things including climate change. Earlier this is what Angela Merkel told supporters at a campaign event. The times when we could completely count on others, they are over to a certain extent. I have experienced this in the last few days, and that is why I can only say that we Europeans must really take our fate into our own hands. Now, a little earlier, I spoke with Ryan Heath, senior EU correspondent with Politico, and asked him what he thought about Mrs. Merkel's extraordinary comments. It's very clear that what we're seeing is that both sides of the transatlantic relationship are starting to doubt whether the other side is reliable. And Angela Merkel does not make light statements. She thinks about every word that comes out of her mouth. So there is meaning to what she has to say, but she did use a few qualifiers in that statement. So she's not exactly throwing the U.S. overboard yet. Ryan, what, what, what are the critical issues for the Europeans? Uh, obviously, we didn't hear Donald Trump uh, reassert Article 5, uh, mutual defence uh, within NATO, but other things too. One major point of concern for a lot of Europeans uh, uh, is uh, climate change, and Angela Merkel actually spoke on that too. She said it was six against one. She said it was very unsatisfactory. What, what are the main issues? Well, climate is definitely up there, and what is very clear about Donald Trump's approach is that he is going to take the side of the US oil and gas industry, most likely. Now, what a lot of players within that sector and around the rest of the world were saying 
was that the Paris Climate Agreement doesn't tell you how to reach these goals to reduce your emissions. It just sets an end finish line that you need to get to. So Donald Trump needs to decide whether that's enough flexibility for him or whether he's going to throw himself out of that agreement. The other big deal is obviously trade-related talks. So the EU would love to have a free trade deal with the US. Donald Trump, he's been the new uh, flagship bearer for protectionism, and he doesn't really seem to be in the mood to be doing the big sort of trade deals like TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, that the Obama administration and the EU had been working towards for the past three years. Meanwhile, in Washington, it has been a working Sunday for Donald Trump after he returned from his first foreign trip abroad as president. Now, despite nine days overseas, the issue of Russia and questions about possible campaign ties still loom as senior advisor Jared Kushner finds himself in the middle of a fresh controversy. Mr. Trump didn't comment when asked about the reports after arriving back at the White House. All right, let's head out to Washington now. Ryan Nobles is on duty at the White House for us. And uh, uh, what a day. Word that the staff were huddling, they're circling the wagons, talk of a war room. What, what, what does the president return to? Well, he returns to a lot of unanswered questions, frankly, Michael, especially after being on the road for more than a week and, and not holding a press conference while new allegations and new reports surfaced, it seemed, by the day here in Washington. Uh, and specifically, the, the biggest bombshell being this report that Jared Kushner, the son-in-law, uh, and, of course, close advisor of the president, uh, attempted to set up a, a back-channel communication, a secret line between the transition team and the Kremlin after the president was elected and before he was inaugurated. And the White House has refused to comment on this. They're not confirming or denying it. Instead, they're sending out administration officials who are talking about it broadly, not uh, as it relates to Jared Kushner specifically, but saying if it did happen, it really wouldn't be that big of a deal. This is what Homeland Security Secretary John Kelly said this morning. I know Jared. He's a great guy, decent guy. Uh, his number one <clears throat> number one interest really is the, is the uh, is the nation. So uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of different ways to communicate uh, back channel, uh, you know, publicly uh, with with other countries. I I don't see any uh, big issue here relative to um, relative to Jared. I think any time you can open uh, lines of communication with uh, anyone, whether they're good friends or not so good friends, is a, is a smart thing to do. Of course, John Kelly is talking about this uh, in so somewhat of a hypothetical situation, uh, Michael, and that doesn't lend itself to this specific issue, one that uh, included a report that there was a suggestion that this line would have been set up inside a diplomatic facility uh, in the United States that was run by the Russians. So there are a lot of different tentacles about this issue that the White House has yet to weigh in on and why many here in Washington still have a lot of questions. Yep, they certainly are. Ryan, thanks so much. Ryan Noble's there at the White House. And we're going to talk a little more about the reports involving Jared Kushner with a retired CIA chief of Russia operations coming up in about 15 minutes. Do stick around uh, for that. All right, the U.S. could soon ban passengers from bringing their laptops on all international flights, entering or leaving the U.S. That is new. Right now, laptops are banned in cabins on some U.S.-bound flights on seven foreign airlines. On Sunday, U.S. Homeland Security uh, Secretary John Kelly explained why he is considering this new move. There's a real threat. Uh, there's numerous threats against aviation. That's, th that's really the, the thing that they're obsessed with, uh, the terrorists, uh, the, the idea of knocking down an airplane in flight, particularly if it's a U.S. carrier, particularly it's full of mostly U.S. Uh, uh, folks, uh, people. Um, it's real. Kelly told CNN on Friday he would make a decision on a broader laptop ban when the time is right. You are watching CNN today. When we come back, still ahead, a blight on the land eliminated. How modern day slavery was wiped out in the tomato fields of Florida. And in the Philippines, President Duterte unleashes a new round of offensive remarks. The story next on CNN Today.
African Voices. week, women changing Africa with their creativity. I didn't want to tell stories from just one country's perspective. It was really important for me to compare the different markets, to travel to different markets. African Voices, today on CNN, in association with GLOW. In 2011, we at EDOF planted a seed with the aim of creating an ever-expanding forest. We nurtured that seed and helped it grow. Inspired by the ethics of giving, our seed grew into a strong tree. Branches emerged with similar aims of compassion, humanitarianism, and love. We spread our seeds to help even more people. As blessed is the influence of one true loving human soul on another. In Syria, our aim is to provide relief to 12 million in need, 3.8 million refugees, about half of whom are children. We use our reach to raise awareness of the 30 million slaves in the world today, of the thousands of children trafficked through Europe and the US. We continue to grow into cutting-edge medical research. Our mission, make a difference to people's health, save lives and support NGOs that plant more seeds. Welcome back as we turn to the CNN Freedom Project and a story of forced labor in Florida. We have a three-part series about what happened when activists and farm workers fought back against modern-day slavery. Here's my colleague Amra Walker with part one. Immokalee, Florida. Hot humid and home to thousands of migrant workers who board buses early every morning bound for tomato farms scattered throughout the region. Immokalee is the epicenter of tomato production in the United States. Florida produces 90 percent of the country's winter tomatoes. It also used to be ground zero for modern-day slavery in agriculture. We found out that workers were being held by armed guards, you know, prevented from leaving, um, pistol whipped, um, some sexually assaulted. Laura Germino is one of the founders of the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, or CIW, a grassroots nonprofit that began in 1993 to improve wages and working conditions of migrant farm workers. Initially, it was not an anti slavery organization or anti human trafficking organization. But in the course of our outreach, we began to come across situations where workers were being held against their will. Since then, the CIW's anti-slavery program has uncovered and helped the U.S. government prosecute several horrific cases of forced labor on tomato farms. In one of those cases, just 10 years ago, farm workers were locked inside a truck at night. It was a dozen workers housed in a windowless box truck, forced to be in there at night, sleep in there at night, use the bathroom in there at night. One of them held out his hands, and you could see the marks from the chains, which his wrists had been chained with. That case was so shocking, CIW decided to buy a box truck that was the exact make and model as the one used in the case and turn it into a mobile museum, highlighting other cases of forced labor from the past 20 years. Today, the CIW has a staff of 17 people, nearly all of them former migrant farm workers themselves. And their focus is no longer uncovering cases of slavery, it's preventing it from happening in the first place. Forced labor has been virtually eradicated, and if it were to take root, it would be identified and dealt with really quickly. They do that through an innovative initiative called the Fair Food Program. Participating growers allow CIW staff to come onto their farms and hold mandatory education sessions for all workers. They're given booklets that outline their rights 
and a hotline to call if they experience violations. The growers also agree to regular third-party inspections of their farms. A team of auditors speaks confidentially with at least 50% of workers to ensure their rights are being respected. Laura Safer Espinoza is a former Supreme Court Justice for the state of New York. She now spends her retirement in Florida, running the Fair Food Standards Council, which oversees the audits. Places that were called ground zero for modern day slavery by federal prosecutors a few years ago are now cited by national and international human rights experts as the best work environment in U.S. agriculture. And there are real market consequences at the top of the supply chain if violations are found. That's because many of the largest buyers of tomatoes have also joined the program, agreeing to purchase tomatoes only from farms that are part of the agreement. The Fair Food Program started in Florida and now covers seven states in the eastern part of the U.S. Carlos Hernandez spends a tomato growing season in Florida. In the off season, he travels to the western U.S., where he says it's much different. Sometimes, when you don't work fast enough, they threaten to fire you. Well, that doesn't happen here. There are better protections here. When we get calls from outside the fair food program, it is heartbreaking. There are roughly 30,000 people currently working on fair food program farms and receiving all the protections and benefits <laughs> outlined in the agreement. But there's still a long way to go to bringing the rest of the country on board. Amaral Walker, CNN. Well, coming up on the pro project, the Freedom Project tomorrow, the story of Alejandrina uh, Carrera. She is a migrant worker on a Florida tomato farm. She arrived in the U.S. from Mexico at 14 years of age, young, naive. She was easy prey for those wanting to take advantage of her. He told me, if we don't do this the easy way, we'll do it the hard way. I was afraid and trembling. He tried to abuse me sexually, but he didn't get to because another worker heard me screaming and came to help me. The next day, the boss fired us both. Find out how one organization is changing the lives of migrant workers in the U.S. by protecting them from forced labor at this time tomorrow right here on the CNN Freedom Project. The Philippine president says he will not listen to his own country's Supreme Court and Congress when it comes to martial law. Rodrigo Duterte declared 60 days of it last week in the southern Mindanao region where troops are fighting ISIS-linked militants. But the Philippine Constitution says Congress must approve martial law and it can only last 60 days. Meanwhile, on Friday, while delivering a pep talk to troops, extraordinary comments, President Duterte warning them against committing human rights violations and then joking that they could commit rape with impunity. Here's how he put it. Of Marcelo and the ramifications of Marcelo. I and I alone would be responsible. The power of the people. The power of the people. The power of the people. Well, that's not his first time joking about sexual assault. When running for office last year, candidate Duterte made tasteless remarks about the rape and murder of an Australian missionary in his own hometown. Sri Lanka's Disaster Management Centre reporting 151 people have been killed in severe flooding and landslides. India and several aid agencies helping with relief efforts, but Sri Lanka is seeking additional foreign assistance to help more than 100,000 people now living in shelters. Tom Sater is here with a look at the weather uh, forecast. Uh, just terrible video coming out of the region. What, what's ahead? You know, I mean, millions around the world celebrate the oncoming monsoon. I mean, it's their livelihoods. It's the economy. It brings life, but it, it takes lives too. In fact, uh, Michael, that death toll of 151, 
is going to unfortunately rise. As authorities tell us, another 111 are still missing. Three major rivers are on the rise, evacuations of thousands along the banks, but also we had as many as five landslides that buried scores, uh, cutting off villages. The need for aid, a big cry for international help. Uh, India sent their second relief vessel there. We've got help coming from Pakistan, the UN as well. But again, the monsoon rains, this is just in Sri Lanka right now. They've had a good 24 hour period, which has been good to get some helicopters up and start to do some air rescues, as well as getting aid out. They're in big need of fresh water right now. 450 53. Yeah, we've had isolated mounts as much as 500. The beginning of the India monsoon has yet to be declared. It's typically around June 1st, and our current position is a little behind schedule, but it's right over where we had the flooding in the western and southern sections of Sri Lanka. We watch the monsoons, again, typically around June 1st, make their way up for the entire month of June. But it all begins in the southwest. That's why we call it the southwest monsoons, and the flow moves into Kerala. This is the state that really signals the start of it once they pick up several days of rainfall. In 20, uh, 2006 to 2011, it started early, but every year after, it's been a little late. Last year, significant. Each day is really important. So we're going to watch that. Now, the forecast from India's Med Department calling for 90%, uh, 96% of normal, which is fantastic. Last year was the first beneficial monsoon rain they've had year in three years, and usually 89 centimeters kind of blankets the entire part. But again, if you only drop that down to 90%, that's considered deficient. Unfortunately, more flood rains for Sri Lanka. We'll see if they call for the start of this in Kerala. Now, as we look at international aid and the call for this, we've had villages that had five and a half meters high water uh, rolling through the region. That's 18 feet. Preheat in India is increasing, but you think that's something. Just yesterday on Sunday in Pakistan, 54 degrees. That's 129 degrees. That staggers the imagination. We believe that is an all-time May heat record for Pakistan. And now we've got a tropical cyclone that's developing. So international call for aid will have to go toward Myanmar and uh, Bangladesh in the days ahead. Should stay as a minimal tropical storm, but that shoves a lot of water in this area. So a lot of concerns right now with the beginning of the monsoon seasons and the cyclone development we're seeing now in the Bay of Bengal. Yeah, exactly. Tom, keep an eye on it for us. Thanks so much, Tom Sater there. Well, coming up here on the program, we are following new controversy involving Donald Trump's senior advisor and reports of a suggestion to create a Russia back channel. A closer look at this when I speak with a retired CIA officer. That's coming up. Indonesia, a culture in transition. Meet the people, trying to keep traditions we need to educate the people, the children, because the party is our culture. While creating a new modern identity. Our mission is to draw global attention to the cuisine. The Keepers, Wednesday on CNN. Philippe Chatrier Court is raked and ready for Roland Garros to begin. I love Paris. It's a magical place. The best tennis players in the world are finding their feet on the red clay. Can Novak Djokovic extend his reign over Roland Garros? Or will Rafa Nadal take it back and win his 10th French Open crown? Definitely going to be the player to beat. Join us at Roland Garros for a Grand Slam edition of Open Court, Saturday on CNN, in association with Longines. CNN World Rugby. It's the Sevens World Series for both men and women. We've got the numbers and the names. Follow the rugby action on and off the pitch with CNN's Alex Thomas and Christina McFarlane. We'll bring you match highlights and training tips. Kick off your weekend with CNN World Rugby. Tuesday on CNN. In association with DHL. The country has its new president. This is the State of America. Join me, Kate Baldwin, for the latest in U.S. politics, the Donald Trump presidency, and a nation divided. We have smart people. A political win is often not a win for the taxpayers. And smart discussions. What would the role be? Could, is this even possible? Absolutely it's possible. And a whole lot of fun. My that ears are melting off of my head. Okay. State of America with Kate Baldwin, tonight on CNN. I'm Patrick Snell in Atlanta, and this is CNN.
And welcome back to CNN Today, everyone. I'm Michael Holmes. Time to update you on the top stories. Breaking news on North Korea's latest ballistic missile test. The U.S. Pacific Command says it was a short-range missile launched from Wonsan. Japan says it appears to have landed inside its economic zone. The Japanese Prime Minister now saying that concrete action will be taken and that these continued provocations cannot be tolerated. British police have 13 men in custody now after conducting more raids on Sunday in Manchester. They are working to track down people connected to the attacker who killed 22 people last week. The city also on Sunday held its Great Manchester Run. More than 35,000 people taking part in that race. It has been a working day in Washington for U.S. President Donald Trump, who is just back, of course, from a nine-day trip abroad. Mr. Trump facing a new controversy involving son-in-law and senior aide Jared Kushner. Reports say he attempted to establish a back channel with Russia for Trump's team. Well, while we are yet to hear any comment officially from the White House, the U.S. Homeland Security Secretary said, quote, I don't see a big deal, but not everyone agrees. For more on the Kushner controversy, I'm joined by Steve Hall, CNN national security analyst and a retired CIA chief of Russia operations. So you're the man to talk about this with, Steve. Uh, back channel communications, uh, uh, these are really for keeping sensitive discussions from the public, not the executive branch as it looks in this case. How does it look to you in the context of Russian interference in the election? You know, this is such a strange story. It's really difficult to, to try to explain it or make sense of it or get to the bottom of it. There's, to, to start with, there's a lot of confusion, a lot of terminology that's being thrown around, back channel being, being one of them. In this particular case, it seems to me there's, there's two options. Uh, either Kushner went in, uh, well, if the story, assuming the story is accurate, if Kushner went in to Ambassador Kislyak Karen in Washington or when he was in New York, and said, I want to establish some sort of sort of channel with you. Uh, and, and whether or not it was using Russian technology to do so is also somewhat bizarre and still unclear. Mm -hmm. But there's really two reasons he could have done that. The first would have been simply, you know, naivete and basically not understanding how the government and how the system works. Kislyak's response should have been, uh, Mr. Kushner, I appreciate you coming to me. Uh, and anything you need to get to Moscow, please just tell me and I will make sure it gets back to them. The second question is if it's, or the second option is if it's a back channel type of thing, then who does he want to keep this from? And was he trying to actually, during, before the president was actually inaugurated, to keep it from U.S. intelligence services? In other words, start basically doing government operations with the governments when the new administration had not yet taken over the government and some sort of hiding of that. Neither of those make a whole lot of sense to me. I, I really don't understand why he would have done that under either circumstances. So it's just, it's just really bizarre. So, so, you know, as, as the story is, is, is presented, he would be going to a Russian facility to have these conversations with Russians in a Russian facility using Russian communicate. Why would you do that? It, there, there is no rational, reasonable res uh, yeah, explanation for that at all. And, and for that reason, I, 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 I mean, I don't mean to cast doubt on the journalists who wrote the story, but that, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. First of all, I can tell you for sure the Russians would never allow that. You're not going to have the Russian ambassador and the Russian security services say, yeah, this would be fine. We'll have an American sit down, sit down in front of a whole bunch of sensitive technical Russian equipment that simply seeing it would reveal some of their capability. Uh, so that's, that's simply not going to happen. Again, Ambassador Kislyak's appropriate response should have been something along the lines of, Mr. Kushner, anytime you'd like to speak to me uh, before the inauguration or afterwards, I'm always here. We can meet in a discreet location, and I will make sure that everything you tell me or want, to, or want to convey to me gets back. So the whole, you know, going to the embassy doesn't make a lot of sense either. To, to that point, I mean, there are questions about why the Russian ambassador would report back to head office about such a thing on a communication system that he probably knew was being monitored by the U.S. I mean, is, is there the specter here, the possibility that this was a false lead by the Russians, a bit of a setup? So, no doubt, the Russians, the Russians uh, absolutely know and understand when they are being listened to and, you know, when, when the attempt to try to listen to them might be more successful or less successful. So, if this was over an open telephone line that Kislyak made these, uh, these, these comments, then he must have known uh, that indeed they would have been picked up by the American government. 
Uh, but then the question becomes, well, then why would he, if, if the idea is he's trying to leak something, he's trying to influence something, he's trying to get some piece of maybe false information out there to make somebody look bad or to, to accomplish some goal, what goal would it be and who mm. is he trying to make look bad? Because recall at the time, the Russians thought uh, was based on candidate Trump's comments, things are going to be very much better with this president. He's talking about lifting sanctions. He's talking about saying Crimea is not so important, Ukraine not so important, NATO obsolete. So yeah. why would he say something like that that would clearly get the Trump administration in trouble early on? It just doesn't make sense. None of it, none of it does, really. You look at it from both angles, it doesn't make sense. Uh, do your head in looking at this too closely. But it does seem to have created concern in some areas of the intelligence community. Uh, there was the uh, former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, on Sunday saying that he was very concerned. Let's play that now and, and have a chat on the other side. Just from a theoretical standpoint, I will tell you that um, uh, my dashboard warning light was clearly on and I think that was the case with uh, all of us in the intelligence community, very concerned about uh, the nature of these uh, uh, approaches uh, to the Russians. So a lot of questions there, I mean, a lot of uh, concerns, but as, as you point out uh, uh, quite rightly, uh, uh, Steve, a lot of questions about motivation here. One, one thing is, of course, Kushner isn't just an advisor. He is family, the president's son-in-law. Does that make this even less seemly, if you like? Well, it certainly makes it much more complicated. First of all, I agree with, uh, with Jim Thacker's comments. He was a very good DNI. And when I served, you know, I liked him a lot because he really understood the Russia piece. So I take him very seriously when he says he's concerned uh, about the Russian side of things. But yeah, Kushner's proximity, you know, being a member of the president's family uh, makes, this, makes this that much more complicated. Really, this story is so bizarre. The one thing that really concerns me, if you sort of step back and look at it from a 30,000 foot level contextually, is, is that it is another data point. And I think this is what Clapper was referring to. It's yet another data point that is associated with the Trump administration, the Trump team, and now even the Trump family. Uh, and, and their ties back to Russia. If any one of these things had happened, you might just write it off and say, well, that's, that's just crazy or that's bizarre. That can't be right. But these, these things keep coming up again and again and again, like another piece of data, another you know, pillar, pillar of smoke going up. And, and it's good that we're investigating this back here, that the FBI and that the special counsel and that the Congress is taking a look at this because there may be something there when you put all these individual data points together. Yeah, just so so many uh, contacts and, and, and also, uh, in many cases, uh, not being revealed. I've uh, got to leave it there, unfortunately. Steve Hall, CNN National Security Analyst, a retired CIA Chief of Russia Operations. Always good to get your expertise, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take a short break here on the program. When we come back, Can is a wrap. The top winners from the glitzy film fest on the Riviera. That's coming up. is flourishing, ever expanding, but it's not just about bigger and taller anymore. See how this city is using new ways to build a smarter, leaner and greener metropolis of the future. Dubai is incredibly comfortable with thinking big, not being limited by a risk matrix, but looking and seeing what's possible. How is ambition driving innovation in one of the harshest climates on earth? Global Gateway, Vision in the Desert, a CNN special, Friday. Russia, a vibrant country with a wealth of history and culture. And now, cashing in on a wealth of business opportunities. In a CNN special, John Devterios explores how the largest country in the world is positioning itself for global growth. Bold moves, complex relationships. From politics to economics, see what makes this country a major player in our world. Marketplace Russia, Saturday on CNN. Plug into the first ever all-electric racing series. 
Formula E. Go behind the scenes with Nikki Shields in the cities hosting the E-Pre action. Meet the drivers racing through downtown street circuits across the globe. And check out the technology driving us all towards a greener future. CNN Supercharged, Tuesday on CNN, in association with DHL. Welcome back, everyone. In Hong Kong, hundreds of pro-democracy demonstrators march through the streets, calling on Beijing to show greater respect for human rights. The rally coming one week before the anniversary of the Tiananmen Square massacre. We see we still have the responsibility uh, uh, to call for justice. And secondly, uh, Hong Kong now is part of China. Hong Kong people also see uh, we need to change uh, even the uh, political structure of China so as to protect the freedom and the human rights of Hong Kong. A vigil is to be held in Hong Kong next Sunday, June 4, which is exactly 28 years after the crackdown. Well, the jury has returned its verdict at the Cannes Film Festival. The Esquire. A taste of the celebration there when filmmaker Pedro Almodova announced the top prize, the Swedish film The Square, taking home the coveted Palme d'Or. Almodova said the movie is about, quote, the dictatorship of being politically correct, unquote. Best actress went to Diane Kruger for In the Fade, a role she played in her native German. And Joaquin Phoenix takes Best Actor honours for his role in You Were Never Really Here. Now you know. Wish I'd been there. Thanks for watching. I'm Michael Holmes. World's for coming up.